CD two, track twenty three. One. Apply for. Application. Applicant. Two. Campaign. Campaign. Campaigner. Three. Employ. Employment. Employer. Employee. Four. Interview. Interview. Interviewer. Interviewee. Five. Recruit. Recruitment. Recruit. Six. Review. Review. Reviewer. CD two. Track twenty four. One. Tell us about your weaknesses. I'm not a morning person. In fact, I struggle to get up this morning. I'd like to be able to start work after lunch. Two. It's a pity you haven't had any experience of restaurant work. Don't worry, we are very good at eating, and that's why we think we should get the job. Three. Do you like the job you have now? No, I don't, because I have to answer the phone a lot, and I hate that. CD two, track twenty five. In today's program, we're taking a look into the future of work. With us in the studio, we have a specialist in future trends in the workplace, Dr. Atkins. Dr. Atkins, what do you think the world of work will look like ten years from now? Well, it certainly won't look the same as now. Technology now enables us to work anywhere, and so there's been a steady rise in people working from home and a sharp drop in the number of people commuting to work. As technology takes over tasks that people used to do, what kind of skills will be useful for people in the future? People will have to focus on the kind of skills that can't be done by a machine or a robot, such as leadership and management jobs, or caring for other humans. So you don't think that dentists and teachers should worry about their jobs just yet? No, definitely not. Jobs in the medical and teaching professions will be unchanged. Many of the traditional jobs will still be necessary ten or twenty years from now. We'll always need lawyers, politicians, firefighters, and so on. And we mustn't forget the creative industries. We'll always need artists, writers, and actors. I also think there will be a marked increase in jobs connected with alternative energy. What sort of jobs would they be? Well, things like solar panel engineers or wind turbine technicians. Right, I see. So, which jobs do you think are at risk in the future? Um, I think there will be a gradual decline in jobs in retail. Shop assistants aren't required in the days of online shopping. Any office jobs and factory jobs that can be done by computers and robots will disappear. Finally, can you name any job titles that don't exist now and will in the future? I think we'll see jobs like、uh, body part maker, robot mechanic, and space tourist guide, but I could be completely wrong. CD two, track twenty six. Welcome back to our program exploring the future of work. We asked four people their thoughts on their careers and where they saw them in the future. Our first speaker is Julie Robinson. A lawyer. A career in law is stable because laws don't tend to change fast. It's challenging and potentially well paid if you get a high-powered job in a top law firm. However, I believe there's been a sharp drop in law graduates recently because it's so expensive to study law at university for six years. 
some law firms are offering apprenticeships so that trainees can start work and earn a salary while they're training. Technology has had an effect on our profession. Some of the jobs that lawyers used to do can now be done online. Fortunately, these tend to be tedious tasks that nobody liked doing. On the whole, being a lawyer can be an extremely rewarding and lucrative career. Our second speaker is Geoffrey Smith, a dentist. My dental practice is always busy and I can't see that changing in the future. As far as clients are concerned, I've noticed a marked increase in elderly patients who want to keep their teeth in good condition. Technology has changed the way I work and will probably continue to make my job easier. There have been great advances in the medication we use to manage pain, so my patients can relax a bit more. I know people hate coming to see me. I don't blame them, but I don't think they'd be any happier if I was replaced by a robot. Our third speaker is Angie Walters, a shop assistant. The supermarket where I work is always busy, so it's hard to believe my job is going to disappear. If you ask me, people want to see what they're buying. I do. But the experts say that there will be a gradual decline in supermarket sales and so my job isn't secure. I'd hate to lose my job because I think I've got great interpersonal skills and I'm quite good at handling difficult customers. Some people think my job's monotonous, but I find this human contact with the customers very fulfilling. If we close down, I worry that some of my elderly customers will never go out and see anyone. That's not progress, is it? Finally, our fourth speaker is Mark Pomroy, a wind turbine technician. I'm working in the alternative energy industry. To work with wind turbines, you need to do a two-year course in applied sciences, and this will teach you the basic technology. The skills you need are to be good with your hands and it helps to have some experience in mechanics. In my free time I enjoy taking car engines apart and putting them back together so that helps. After studying the basics I did an apprenticeship with a company and learnt on the job. My job's demanding but I think it will be an important career in the near future. Well, thank you to our four speakers, it's interesting to hear. CD2 Track 27 A contract To contract An export To export An import To import An increase To increase a market to market a recruit to recruit a review to review a target to target CD2 track 28 1. Challenging Demanding 2. Fulfilling Rewarding 3. Important High-powered 4. Monotonous Tedious. Five. Secure. Stable. Six. Well paid. Lucrative. CD two. Track twenty nine. The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid by Bill Bryson. Chapter 1 Harper's Magazine in December 1951 published an article by Nancy B. Mavity on an unsettling new phenomenon, the two-income family, in which husband and wife both went out to work to pay for a more ambitious lifestyle. 
Mavity's worry was not how women would cope with the demands of employment on top of child rearing and housework, but rather what this would do to the man's traditional status as breadwinner. I'd be ashamed to let my wife work, one man told Mavity tartly, and it was clear from her tone that Mavity expected most readers to agree. Remarkably, until the war, many women in America had been unable to work, whether they wanted to or not. Up until Pearl Harbor, half of the 48 states had laws making it illegal to employ a married woman. In this respect, my father was commendably, I would even say enthusiastically, liberal, and was completely in favor of my mother working. She worked for the Des Moines Register as the home furnishings editor, in which capacity she provided calm reassurance to two generations of homemakers who were anxious to know whether the time had come for Paisley in the bedroom and whether they should have square sofa cushions or round. Because they both worked, we were better off than most people of our socio-economic background, which in Des Moines in the 1950s was most people. We, which is to say my parents, my brother, Michael, my sister Mary Elizabeth, or Betty, and I, had a bigger house on a larger lot than most of my parents' colleagues. It was a white clapboard house with black shutters and a big screened porch on top of a shady hill on the best side of town. The only downside of my mother's working was that it put a little pressure on her with regard to running the home and particularly with regard to dinner, which frankly she wasn't very good at anyway. My mother always ran late and was dangerously forgetful. You soon learned to stand aside about ten to six every evening, for it was then that she would fly in the back door, throw something in the oven, and disappear into some other quarter of the house to embark on the thousand other household tasks that greeted her each evening. In consequence, she nearly always forgot about dinner until a point slightly beyond way too late. As a rule, you knew it was time to eat when you could hear potatoes exploding in the oven. We didn't call it the kitchen in our house. We called it the Burns Unit. It's a bit burned, my mother would say apologetically at every meal, presenting you with a piece of meat that looked like something, a much-loved pet perhaps, salvaged from a tragic house fire. But I think I scraped off most of the burned part, she would add, overlooking that this included every bit of it that had once been flesh. Happily, all this suited my father. His palate only responded to two tastes, burned and ice cream. So everything was fine by him so long as it was sufficiently dark and not too startlingly flavorful. Theirs truly was a marriage made in heaven, for no one could burn food like my mother or eat it like my dad. As part of her job, my mother bought stacks of housekeeping magazines. House Beautiful, House and Garden, Better Homes and Gardens, Good Housekeeping, and I read these with a certain avidity, partly because they were always lying around and in our house all idle moments were spent reading something, and partly because they depicted lives so absorbingly at variance with our own. The housewives in my mother's magazines were so collected, so organized, so calmly on top of things, and their food was perfect. Their lives were perfect. They dressed up to take their food out of the oven. CD 2 Track 30 1 As a rule Usually 2 With regard to In connection with In terms of 3 On the contrary Just the opposite 4. In fact. Actually. 5. On top of. In addition to. 6. Under these circumstances. Because of this. CD2. Track 31. 
friends Hannah and Daniel are working in Daniel's dad's bike shop during the summer holidays. Today, they are responsible for opening the shop. Right, here we are. Have you got the keys? Yep. Thanks. OK. Uh, What's the matter? I've no idea. I can't seem to open it. What do you mean? Just put the key in and turn it. Yes, thank you, Einstein. Every time I try to turn it, it gets stuck. Well, what's up with it? How should I know? Perhaps there's something wrong with the lock. Well, have you tried turning it the other way? The other way? I doubt that'll work, but let's see. And... No, that doesn't make any difference. Now what? Let me try. OK. Careful. Not too hard, it'll... Oops. Oh, it's broken off in the lock. Hannah, why on earth did you do that? I didn't do it on purpose. What are we supposed to do now? Calm down. I think I might have left the toilet window open round the back. Perhaps if I climb through, I'll be able to open the door from the inside. At least then we can open the shop on time. We'll work out what to do about the lock later. At the back of the shop... Yes, it's open. Problem solved. Help me up. OK, be careful. I'm not sure this is a good idea. It looks a bit small. Are you sure you'll fit? Are you saying I'm fat? What? <laughs> I'm joking, Daniel. OK, one, two, three... Oh! Ah! Ouch! <laughs> oh! I can't get my leg through. Are you OK? No, I can't move. OK, this isn't going to work. Come back out. OK. Ah. Oh. Daniel, I can't. What are you doing? I'm stuck. What am I going to do now? Well, you should have thought about that earlier. <laughs> oh, no, that's it. My dad is going to kill us. CD2 Track 32 1 What's up? Well, unfortunately, I seem to have broken the barcode scanner. Oh, no. What happened? I put it on the table during the break and spilled my coffee on it, like an idiot. Whoops. <laughs> The manager isn't going to be happy. Yeah, tell me about it. Every time I try to switch it on, it beeps and switches off again. Have you tried drying it under the hand dryer in the toilets? Actually, no, but it's worth a go, I suppose. Two. Hello, Woodtop Farm. Uncle Pete, it's me. I'm in the bottom field. The tractor has broken down. What? What's the matter with it? Uh, I wish I knew. OK, listen, are the lights working? Uh, hang on a second. Oh, yep. OK, then it's not the battery. You did remember to put some fuel in it, right? Uh, oh. Leo, I told you it was nearly empty. I, um, oh, I forgot. Sorry. Well, you'll have to walk back up here and get some, won't you? What? It's miles. Well, you should have thought about that earlier. Next time, perhaps you'll remember. Can't you bring some down in the... Hello? Hello? CD2. Track 33. One. Authentic. Two. Genuine. Three. Create the illusion. Four. Deceive. Five. Distort the truth. Six. Manipulate. Seven. Misleading. 8. 
sensationalize. Nine. Doctored. Ten. Fake. CD two. Track thirty four. One. Take something at face value. Two. Take something out of context. Three. Take something for granted. Four. Take pride in something. Five. Take something with a pinch of salt. Six. Take responsibility for something. CD two. Track thirty five. One. Far fetched. Two. Ill advised. Three. Light hearted. Four. Stony faced. Five. Worldly wise. Six. Wrinkle free. CD two, track thirty six. One. Far reaching. Two. Ill timed. Three. Kind hearted. Four. Two faced. Five. Streetwise. Six. Tax free. CD two. Track thirty seven. Reports are coming in from London of a new mural by enigmatic street artist Banksy. Banksy's real identity is unknown. Some people believe his real name is Robert Banks, while others say that he's Robin Gunningham, who was born in Bristol in 1973. Banksy has never confirmed or denied any of these reports, and his identity remains a mystery, even though his art is recognised worldwide. There is an unconfirmed rumour that he trained to be a butcher before becoming a street artist. His graffiti art became famous in the 1990s in Bristol and London, but he chose to remain anonymous at first to avoid being arrested for acts of vandalism. So far, he has managed to protect his true identity and has remained out of reach of the authorities. When a new Banksy appears in the street, he posts it on his website. This is how he authenticates his street art and confirms to the public that it is genuine and not a fake. His artworks can fetch hundreds of thousands of pounds in auction. It is unclear how much of this money goes to Banksy himself, though people say he is worth twenty million dollars. CD two. Track thirty-eight. What are you doing? I'm trying to find some information on the internet for my art project. I've got to do an essay about artists who raise ethical issues through their work. Hmm, that sounds interesting. I did a similar module on my degree. You should write about street artists like Banksy who make statements about society through graffiti. I don't know much about him. Do you? Quite a bit, yeah. I used to think he was American because he's done a lot of work in New York, but it turns out that he's actually English. He's been doing street art for twenty-five years, but I've no idea how old he was when he started. Actually, it's amazing how he's managed to stay so enigmatic. But apparently, his friends are really loyal and committed to helping him remain anonymous. I don't know much about his background. Nobody does, but I can tell you about his murals and his painting techniques if you like. Yes, that would be good.
OK, he started off painting onto walls and then later he started using stencils and spray cans to speed up the painting process. When you want your identity to remain a secret, you don't want to hang around the streets too long doing something illegal. I mean, he is breaking the law. Yeah, I suppose he is. Right, let me just finish writing that down. OK, so what's he trying to achieve with all this? What does he believe in? Well, he's quite political. He calls himself an activist and he's against authority in general. He has strong beliefs about people and the way we live our lives. So which issues is he most interested in? He's anti-war, so some of his murals show soldiers holding flowers instead of guns to make people aware of the stupidity of war. Look, I'll show you on this website about him. Ah, right. I like the one of the protester who's about to throw a bouquet of flowers. Yeah, that's a good one. And it's quite obvious what it's about. It stands for peaceful protest. Banksy also does a lot of paintings of children. His most popular image is a girl with a red heart-shaped balloon. Here it is. Oh, yes. I love that one. But it's a bit sad. The balloon is floating away from the little girl. I'm not sure what the underlying message is, but his art really makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. The meaning isn't always obvious, but I know he's a strong believer in fairness and equality. That's why he's a good subject for your essay. CD2 Track 39 Alteration Authority Ceremony Commentator Inauthentic Photographer Uncomfortable Underlying Vandalism CD2 Track 40 A Ceremony Commentator Vandalism B Authority Photographer Uncomfortable C Alteration Inauthentic Underlying CD2 Track 41 1 Anonymity Anonymous 2 Belief Believable 3 Enigma Enigmatic 4 Equality Equal 5 Fairness Fair 6 Loyalty Loyal 7 Mystery Mysterious 8 Stupidity Stupid CD2 Track 42 The Imposter 13-year-old Nicholas Barclay disappeared on his way home from a basketball game in San Antonio, Texas. He was never found and was eventually assumed to be dead. Three and a half years later, Nicholas's family were contacted with the news that the missing boy had been found in Spain. Carrie, Nicholas's sister, travelled from Texas to Spain to take her long-lost brother home. It was an emotional reunion, and when she took the boy home to Texas, the family embraced him and told him how much they'd missed him. Nobody in the family questioned why Nicholas, who disappeared in Texas, ended up in Spain. 
and more surprisingly, nobody questioned the fact that this boy looked nothing like the missing boy. Nicholas was fair-haired and blue-eyed. Conversely, the boy claiming to be him had dark features and spoke with a French accent. This is the amazing story of 23-year-old Frédéric Bourdin, a mixed-race Parisian who, in the late 90s, adopted the identity of Nicholas Barclay, a 16-year-old American. In 1997, Bourdin was living in a home for young people in Spain and was planning to run away. He needed a new identity, so he tried to pass himself off as the missing boy from Texas. Having seen a photo of Nicholas on a missing person's flyer, Bourdin bleached his dark hair. He read on the flyer that Nicholas had a cross tattooed between his right index finger and thumb, so he got a friend to give him a tattoo using a needle and ink. There was nothing he could do about his brown eyes, but he decided that he would say his eyes had changed colour as a result of the traumas he had been through. When his disguise was ready, he presented himself at a local government office and said that he was Nicholas Barclay. When Nicholas's sister, Carrie, came to pick him up, Bourdin was sure that she would instantly see through his disguise and realise he wasn't her brother. But instead, Carey rushed towards him and hugged him. In spite of Bourdin's brown eyes and French accent, she was in no doubt that this was her long-lost family member. She even swore under oath that he was her brother and an American citizen, and he was granted an American passport. On the flight back to America, Carey showed Bourdin photos of the family, and he listened carefully, learning everyone's name so that he could recognise them later. He was worried that the family would reject him, but they took him in and he quickly blended into family life. In fact, he managed to live as Nicholas for three and a half months, moving into the teenager's bedroom and even attending a local school. Not long after Bourdin had settled into his new home, a TV station heard about the extraordinary return of the 16-year-old Nicholas and hired Charlie Parker, a private investigator, to look into the disappearance of Nicholas Barclay for a TV show. Parker and the TV crew turned up at Carey's house to interview Bourdin. Right from the start, Parker wasn't taken in by Bourdin. Initially, he was puzzled by the boy's accent, but it was when he came across a photo of the missing teenager that he realised something was very wrong. Having once read that ears are distinct, like fingerprints, he told the cameraman to zoom in on his ears. Once he was back in his office, he studied the ears of both boys and found that they didn't match. He passed on his suspicions to the police. He then called Nicholas's family to tell them what he had discovered, yet they still believed that Bourdin was their son. In the end, Bourdin found it impossible to keep up the lie, and he finally admitted to Charlie Parker that he was Frederick Bourdin. He was later sentenced to six years in jail. Many questions remain unanswered. How could the family not recognise that he wasn't their flesh and blood? Were they really taken in by Bourdin, or were they covering up a more sinister truth? CD 2 Track 43 1 Go through 2 Look into something 3 Pick somebody up 4 Run away 5 Settle in 6. Take somebody in. 7. Turn up. CD 2. Track 44. 1. I firmly believe they do. 
During the 1980s, due to pressure from anti-fur campaigners, the number of fashion designers using fur fell sharply. Sadly, fur seems to be fashionable again these days, so I would say that campaigns and protests are more important than ever. Obviously, protesting is a good way to promote awareness, but I think it is important to make your point peacefully. The anti-fur movement has received criticism in the past for using violent or illegal protests, and I also believe these do more harm than good. It could be argued that some of the more shocking images used in protests actually prevent some people from engaging with the movement. Frankly, I find some of the pictures extremely difficult to look at. 2. Well, one obvious advantage is their ability to deliver a message to huge groups of people. Clearly, a lot of the general public are interested in the lives and opinions of public figures and celebrities. When a celebrity supports the anti-fur movement, lots of people take notice. Regrettably, the opposite is also true. When celebrities are seen wearing fur products, it sends the message that fur is glamorous and desirable. If you ask me, there is nothing glamorous or desirable about killing animals for the sake of fashion. 3. I think I'd emphasise just how many animals have died to make their coat, or hat, or whatever it is they are wearing. Often, people don't realise that to make a single coat from fox fur, for example, 15 to 20 animals have to be killed. I'd like them to think about these poor creatures every time they put on their beautiful coat. Can they really justify that much killing just so they can wear fur? In my opinion, fur is beautiful, but only when it's on the animals to which it belongs. For those who really can't do without the fur look, there are synthetic products that look exactly the same as the real thing. Some protesters feel that even synthetic fur is wrong as it encourages the fashion to continue, but I don't feel particularly strongly about that. CD3 Track 1 1 Bookmark a site. 2. Browse the net. 3. Post a comment. 4. Share a link. 5. Update your status. 6. Upload a photo. CD3 Track 2 1 Addiction 2 Diabetes 3 Eye strain 4 High blood pressure 5 Insomnia 6. Joint pain. 7. Obesity. 8. Repetitive strain injury. CD3. Track 3. 1. Good morning. What seems to be the problem? Hello, Doctor. I'm not feeling very well. I keep getting headaches. OK. I think we need to take your blood pressure. Hmm. It's a bit high. Oh, dear. Oh, what should I do? You need to do more exercise and try not to put too much salt on your food. Oh, no. I love salt. Two. I think I need to change my glasses. Why? They look OK. Because my eyes hurt all the time. Maybe you're spending too much time looking at your computer screen. Hmm. 
That's what my mum says. Three. <sighs> Did you go to bed late last night? No, but I couldn't sleep. I was still awake at four o'clock this morning. Oh dear, that's horrible. I used to have problems sleeping, but since I started running, I sleep like a baby. Four. I think I need to get a better office chair. Really? Yes, my knees hurt when I stand up. Well, I suppose you do spend most of your time sitting at your desk, but good office chairs can be very expensive. Five. I'm worried about my mum. She has to take medication every day. Why's that? She looks okay. She has too much sugar in her blood, and it can be dangerous. But the medication helps. Six. Joe, stop playing that game now and come and have dinner. Okay, I'll be there in a minute. Joe, stop that now. You've been playing that game for five hours. Time to stop. CD three. Track four. One. Address an issue. Two. Attention span. Three. At the expense of something. Four. At your fingertips. Five. Lose track of time. Six. Play a crucial role. Seven. Sedentary lifestyle. Eight. Withdrawal symptoms. CD three. Track five. One. Address a problem. Two. Lifespan. Three. At the risk of something. Four. At your disposal. Five. Keep track of time. Six. Play a vital role. Seven. Hectic lifestyle. Eight. Common symptoms. CD three. Track six. One. Good afternoon. Can I help you? Oh yes, I'm looking for a new laptop. I've got a budget of three hundred pounds. Right. You won't be looking at a top of the range model for that amount, but I'm happy to show you what you can get for three hundred pounds. Let's start here. This one's a basic laptop with a capacity of five hundred gigabytes. That sounds good. Well, compared with how computers used to be, it's not bad. If you just want to do word processing and social networking, it's a waste of money to buy a more powerful computer. But if you want to do gaming and store films and music, you can get the same computer with a one terabyte hard drive for just three hundred and fifty pounds. That's just fifty pounds more. I do want to store films and music. But do I need one terabyte? Well, you may be able to do without the extra storage now, but you need to think about the future. If you want to store music and films, it's well worth spending a bit more. For just fifty pounds, you get a hard drive twice the size. Hmm, I'm not sure. I need to think it over. Of course. If it helps you to make a decision, I'll throw in an external drive with the one terabyte model. Two. At the roundabout, take the third exit. Take the exit. Are you sure this is right? Well, the sat nav seems to think it is. Why? I thought we should be on the motorway by now. I'm going to go towards the motorway. Turn around where possible. The sat nav didn't like that. I don't know why you're going on the motorway when the sat nav was taking us another route. 
Exit ahead. Now it's trying to make us leave the motorway. I really don't think we should be on the motorway at all. Have we got a map anywhere? Why would we need a map? I think we should do what the satnav tells us to do. After 200 meters, take the exit. But I think it's wrong. Why don't we stop at the next service station and have a look at a map? Then we can figure out where to go. OK, but I don't know why you bother to have a satnav if you don't think it works. It was you who talked me into getting it. I hate satnavs. They just wind me up. You just don't like being told what to do. Sorry. Nothing. Turn around where possible. Three. A report into street crime in the UK has revealed that 700,000 handsets were stolen last year. Children under 15 were the most common targets, with up to half a million young people aged between 11 and 15 falling victim to phone theft last year. The report said that mobile phone robbery was mainly carried out by male teenagers. Overall, mobile phone theft has risen 190% since 1995 and police have warned that if present trends continue, thefts are likely to reach 1 million by the end of this year. Since these figures came out, the government have urged mobile phone companies to bring in new security measures. This would allow accounts to be cut off when customers reported the number of their stolen handset. CD3 Track 7 Electronically Technological Scientific Electricity Technologically Electronics CD3 Track 8 1 Science Scientific Scientifically 2 Technology Technological Technologically 3 Electronics Electronic Electronically. 4. Electricity. Electric. Electrically. CD3. Track 9. 1. Satnav. 2. Landline. 3. Remote control. 4. Handset. 5. Domain name. 6. External drive. CD3. Track 10. Rise of the Internet. Meet the most connected man on the planet. For most people, keeping track of emails and staying on top of their calendar might be hard enough. But for American software developer Chris Dancy, life doesn't feel complete without being connected to several hundred devices and applications that collect data about his life at all times. I've been called the most connected human on Earth he says. I've spent the last four years connecting all the devices that I wear to all the smart technology in my home and transmitting all that data through to a single online platform so I can search my entire life. I call it my internet. On a normal day, Dancy travels light, only wearing six devices. Above his eyes sits a headset, which records everything he sees. Around his neck hangs a narrative camera, which requires no photography skills because it takes a picture automatically every 30 seconds. 
On his wrist is a smartwatch, which sends him alerts from his two smartphones, while around the upper arm is a fitness armband, tracking his movement and sleep patterns 24 hours a day. And then there's the stuff you can't see, a heart rate monitor strapped to his chest to measure his heartbeats, and beneath his waistband, a posture sensor, which vibrates when I get tired and I forget my posture and slouch, he beams. Back in Denver, Colorado, all the data from these devices feeds directly into his home environment, which automatically adjusts according to his mood and needs. The house knows my moods, he says. If I've been dashing around all day and get really stressed out so that I don't sleep well, when I wake up, the light is a certain color, the room a particular temperature, and certain music plays. Dancy claims this connected environment, which he calls data-assisted living, has revolutionized his life helping him to lose 100 pounds in 18 months and letting him live in a state of zen-like calm, safe in the knowledge that his every moment is being archived. He can cast an eye over this personal data any time he needs to remember something that happened in the past. I was at a restaurant in Denver, and I was like, what did I eat here last time? So I browsed all the photos from that day and could see exactly what meal it was, he says. He goes on to give another example. When I have a meeting with someone on my calendar, instead of scanning a LinkedIn profile, I can access information about how they made me feel the first time I met them. So, when you're as connected as Dancy, what's the next frontier? All this stuff has to go away, he says. It all needs to be in my clothing. Why can't your shoes have sensors in them? So, if you're wandering around trying to find a location, you don't need a GPS. Your shoe just vibrates left or right. I think this kind of personalized data is really the future. But for now, we have to fix all this stuff onto our clothes, and people stare at you because it looks silly. But what about the issue of ownership of data and privacy? A lot of data is fed back on the web, and a lot of companies now hold huge amounts of data on their customers. Dancy frowns. He is concerned, but is optimistic about the beneficial power of mastering our data as long as we stop giving it away. It's urgent that people look at the data they are creating and giving away. So much of it can be used to make our lives better, rather than lining the pockets of mega-corporations. CD3 Track 11 Moving or not moving 1. Slouch Two, dash around. Three, wander around. Looking at things. Four, cast an eye over. Five, browse. Six, stare at. Showing emotion. Seven. Beam. Eight. Frown. CD3. Track 12. Nobody knows exactly how numbers originated, but, perhaps unsurprisingly, it is thought that numbers and counting began with the number one. The first evidence of this is the Ashango bone, which was found in the Congo region of Africa. The bone is believed to be more than 20,000 years old. It is thought that lines cut into the bone at regular intervals were used for counting. Arithmetic is considered to have originated around 6,000 years ago in Sumeria, an ancient civilization in modern-day Iraq. There was a system of tokens in use, if you had ten chickens, you were given ten tokens. Then, when you sold or killed one of your chickens, a token was removed. 
it is thought that this is how subtraction and therefore arithmetic was invented. Around the time when they were building the pyramids, the Egyptians are known to have invented the numbers 1,000 and 1 million. It might surprise you to know that before 1500, the term mathematics was understood to mean astrology. It only changed to its present meaning between 1500 to 1800. In a world dominated by technology, there are said to be unlimited opportunities for mathematicians and an increasing number of students are expected to be doing maths at university in the future. CD 3 Track 13 Where do our numbers come from? Around 500 BC, the Greek philosopher Pythagoras is understood to have come up with the idea of odd and even numbers. It is said that Pythagoras prepared the way for many famous Greek mathematicians, including Archimedes. Archimedes is considered to be one of the greatest mathematicians of all time and discovered how to measure the volume of an object with an irregular shape. He is believed to have been taking a bath when he made the discovery and leapt out shouting, Eureka! I have found it! Unfortunately, Archimedes was killed by a Roman soldier in 212 BC and mathematics entered a dark age. It is thought that the Romans just weren't interested in mathematics. There are known to have been several other civilizations, including the Maya people in Mexico and scholars in ancient China who contributed to the advancement of mathematics. However, the next big breakthrough was probably in 500 AD when the Indians invented zero. They had already created symbols for the numbers 1 to 9. In fact, it could be argued that our Arabic numerals should rather be known as Indian numerals. After all, it was actually the Indians who invented them. CD 3 Track 14 Whoa! What's this? It looks a bit scary. I'm not sure, to be honest. Hi, and welcome to Mind Blowing Machines. I'm Sam, and I'm an explainer here at the exhibition. Would you like to know a little bit more about this incredible machine? Uh, sure. What is it? It's actually a fully automated remote surgical unit. Uh, I'm afraid you've lost me there. It's a what? Well, basically, it's a kind of robotic surgeon that can be controlled from anywhere in the world. A robotic surgeon? Sounds like something from a nightmare. You'd never get me anywhere near that thing. Ha! Yes, quite a few people say that, but it's perfectly safe. It's operated by a real human surgeon, of course. The two robotic arms here are actually steadier and provide a greater range of movement than the human hand. The machine makes it possible to provide expert surgical services to patients all around the world without the need to travel. Are you saying that the surgeon doesn't actually have to be in the place where the operation takes place? Yes, precisely. Using an ultra-fast telecommunication system, the machine would allow a surgeon here in London, for example, to perform an operation on a patient in Australia or Africa or anywhere in the world, in fact. That's amazing. Mind-blowing, huh? CD 3 Track 15 1 Not many people agree with me, but I think computer games are a bit of a waste of time. I'd rather kick back with my friends than stare at a screen for hours on end. Uh, sorry, but I don't know what you mean by kick back. What I meant was spend time together. You know, hang out, chat, relax. 2. I think I'd die without my phone. And this year's Oscar for Best Actress goes to... Ha ha, very funny. Are you saying I'm being dramatic? Yes, exactly. I think you'd survive without it. 3. 
Dan, I have to answer this question for homework. Can you help, please? Sure. What's the question? In what ways might socially intelligent robots benefit human society? Hmm. Well, I suppose the ability to have conversations with our machines will make a big difference. I'm not sure I follow you. Well, we interact with today's machines mostly by typing or pushing buttons. But some phones and tablets already understand voice commands, right? Imagine they and other machines could react to what you say and talk back to you properly. Hmm. OK. If I understand correctly, you mean we'll be able to have a conversation with our television or our fridge, right? Yes, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd want to have a conversation with a fridge. Why not? Well, they have a reputation for being rather cold. <laughs> oh, very funny. CD three, track sixteen. One. The entertainment industry is set to launch a new scheme in an effort to combat the high levels of internet piracy. The project, backed by UK internet service providers, will see people suspected of downloading illegal content alerted via educational letters, informing them of where they can download the same content through more official channels. Reports suggest that one in five British people engage in some form of copyright infringement, but many believe that the new measures are not severe enough to curb the growing number of internet users downloading illegally. Two. What are you doing? I thought you were doing the washing up. Later. I just thought I'd get half an hour in before we go out. Seriously? So I have to do the washing up again? You play that silly computer game for hours every day. You'd be better off studying for your exam next month. Don't come crying to me if you fail. Oh, it's just a little harmless fun, and it helps me to relax. Relax? Ha! Huh, that's a joke. You get so wound up that you're miserable for ages afterwards, and with your high blood pressure. Oh, come on! Don't exaggerate. Look at last Wednesday when Anne and Bob came over. You could hardly be bothered to talk to them because you'd lost on that game. Three. I don't know why I let myself get talked into buying this smartphone. What's the problem? It's supposed to be a good phone. It has some pre-installed applications. You can see a complete list here. Just keep playing around with it. <sighs> But nothing seems to work. To connect to the internet, you should go to settings and press connect. At least that's what you'd expect. But look, there's no connect option. That's weird. It should be simple enough. Is the Wi-Fi option on? It's hard to tell. When I try to check, the thing just reboots. Nothing does what it's supposed to do. I'll have to take it back to the shop. Four. Do you and your classmates enjoy science? Do you have ideas for new inventions? Then enter the Young Inventors Competition. The competition is open to groups of 11 to 16-year-old students, and entries will be accepted up to the 31st of July. Although the judges will be looking at good basic scientific knowledge, what is most likely to get their attention is an idea which is new and different. In the past, the competition has targeted specific types of inventions. For example, last year's students were asked to design something to help the environment. This year, the topic is completely open, so let your imaginations roam free. More details can be found on our website at www. Five. So, how was the dreaded science lesson today? Actually, not as bad as I thought. We've got a new teacher, and I think she's going to make science lessons a lot more interesting. That's good. But I can't imagine how she's going to do that. Science is science. I know, and I'm really not very good at it. But she started today by showing us a part of a science fiction film in class. Then we had a great discussion about how likely it is that the inventions they showed will actually happen. Now that's my sort of science lesson. Six. Are you okay? Why are you moving your hand and fingers around in that weird way? 
I'm just doing some exercises. I've got a really sore thumb. I think it's because I've been doing so much writing recently. <laughs> I don't think so. It's all the texting you do. You never stop. You know, I hadn't thought of that. You might have a point there. Since this started hurting, I've had to try texting with my fingers and that's really hard. It takes ages too. The easy answer is to cut down on the texting and phone people for a while. You'll be surprised how quickly it clears up. Don't be silly. If I keep phoning people, I won't be able to chat to the people I'm with as well, will I? CD 3 Track 17 1 Current 2 Nutrients 3 Prey 4 Species 5 Tide 6 Whirlpool CD3 Track 18 1 Acid rain 2 Sewage 3 Rubbish tips 4 Industrial waste 5 Contaminants 6 Hazards 7 Debris CD3 Track 19 1 Food chain 2 Ice cap 3 Landfill 4 Oil field 5 Sea level CD3 Track 20 1 Food poisoning 2 Iceberg 3 Landslide 4 Oil well 5 Seashore CD3 Track 21 Mum, where are we going on holiday this year? I wish we could go back to that campsite we went to last year. And the year before, and the year before that, and the year... OK, Ellie, we get the message. Well, it's boring to go to the same place every year. If only we could go somewhere exciting for a change. Like where? I don't know. I just wish we could do something different. Have an adventure. Yes, I agree. I think it's time we did something cultural. I've had enough of lounging on sunbeds. Let's go somewhere where we can learn something about the culture. Well, I don't see what's wrong with sunbeds myself. I wish you all realised how much I look forward to doing nothing for two weeks. I've got a stressful job and I look after you lot too. Look, we can do both. We can go somewhere where you can lie in the sun and we can go and explore the museums and churches. Dad, that wasn't what I meant. I want to have an experience. If only we could go on safari or go trekking in the Himalayas or sail across the ocean. Ha! Sail across the ocean. Can I remind you that we haven't won the lottery recently? Hmm. I'd rather we went to the campsite we went to last year. But Ben, we don't do anything there. We just go to the beach every day. Fine by me. No, Ellie's right. It's time we went outside our comfort zone. We should have a family adventure. 
I've always wanted to do whitewater rafting. Let's go to France. It'll be hot, Mum can sunbathe and we can have an adventure. I'd rather go to the Himalayas. We can go there when you become a millionaire. Here, let's Google whitewater rafting in France. CD3 Track 22 So, what was the best part of the holiday for you? Definitely not the sunburn. If only I'd worn more sunscreen. Hmm, yes. You really suffered, didn't you, Ellie? <laughs> you were so red. But the best part for me was when you fell out of the raft. <laughs> I wish I hadn't forgotten my camera. It would have been a great photo. I wish you'd fallen in too, Ben. Then you wouldn't think it was so funny. The water was freezing. Ugh, it sounds awful. I'm so glad I stayed at the campsite. I just wish I'd known about the mosquitoes. I was bitten to death, but it's better than being frightened to death in the raft. Yes, I must admit it was frightening. But we wanted to go outside our comfort zone, and we certainly did. CD3 Track 23 Welcome to Animal World, this series in which we examine animals' behaviour in their natural habitats. This week, we're turning our attention to some of the smartest animals on the planet. Here to help us is wildlife expert and animal rights campaigner, Dr Roger Matthews. Thank you for joining us, Dr Matthews. Thank you for inviting me. Dr Matthews, if humans are intelligent, then chimpanzees must be intelligent too, because they share 98% of the same genes as humans. Is that right? Yes, it is. And when you spend time with chimpanzees, you can see how close they are to humans in so many ways. They embrace and kiss and hug each other, and they laugh when they're playing. They experience adolescence and develop powerful mother and child bonds. They are also similar to humans in that they attack and kill rival gangs of chimpanzees when they want to extend their territory. Oh, that really is quite shocking. I thought chimps were like humans, but nicer. It's the same with dolphins. When you think of dolphins, words like friendly, gentle, playful, intelligent come to mind. Well, they are undoubtedly intelligent. Dolphins have large brains and they have a number of things in common with humans and chimpanzees. They form stable communities and live in social groups, and they're totally dependent on their parents during childhood. But they're also good at defending themselves and can be quite competitive with one another. When they want to show who's boss or keep other males away from a female, they can be quite aggressive. If we could come nearer to home, Dr Matthews, what about the animals we see every day around us? Right, let's think about farm animals. Which do you think are the least intelligent? Um, least intelligent. Cows, maybe, or no, sheep. Right. Sheep have the reputation for being stupid because they follow the crowd and, frankly, they don't look very bright. However, scientific research shows that they've been seriously undervalued for their intelligence. Sheep are capable of learning. In intelligence tests, they perform at a level very similar to monkeys, and they can recognise people and respond when you call their name. So sheep are, in fact, quite intelligent animals. Extraordinary. It proves that it isn't the animals that look intelligent that are intelligent. Look at owls. We call them wise, but it's a common misconception. Owls are not very clever at all. Yes, things are not always as they appear. Now, before we go any further, there's a question I'd like to ask. Which are smarter, dogs or cats? Well... Cats seem to have strong personalities, while dogs can be rather silly. But in fact, dogs have bigger brains. Their brains have been developing for centuries, while cats' brains have remained unchanged since they were first domesticated by the ancient Egyptians. Why is that? It's down to one simple fact. Dogs are more social than cats, and the more social the animal, the bigger the brain and therefore the smarter the animal. If you think about it, dogs come when you call and spend a lot of time trying to please their owner. They're used as rescue dogs, police dogs, guide dogs. Cats, on the other hand, are loners. Ah, uh, I'm going to defend cats here. 
Dogs do tricks because they've been trained to come when you call their name or to fetch the ball and things like that. I'm sure my cat could do that if she wanted to, but she's too independent to do tricks and she doesn't need the approval of humans like dogs do. Well, everybody thinks their own pet is the smartest. I've got a goldfish and I'm sure he can tell the time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr Matthews. In future, I won't judge an animal on what it looks like. Next week, we're talking about elephants, but until then, goodbye. CD3 Track 24 1 Sheep Ship 2 Keys Kiss 3 Cats Cuts 4 Prove Proof 5 Bag Back CD3 Track 25 1 Cuts 2 Back 3 Sheep 4 Kiss 5 Prove CD3 Track 26 1 Natural Habitat 2 Rival Gang 3 Stable Communities 4 Scientific Research 5 Common Misconception 6 Powerful Bond CD3 Track 27 This week, Film Blog is bringing you four true stories about extraordinary people. Their stories don't always end happily, but their journeys will move and inspire you. A. Rabbit Proof Fence In Australia in 1931, three Aboriginal girls ran away from their white captors and walked 2,400 kilometres to get back home. Their story is told in a film entitled Rabbit Proof Fence. The Aboriginal Protection Act of 1869 gave the government powers over the lives of Aboriginal people, including the power to forcibly remove mixed-race children, those born to a white parent and a black parent, from their families. This story follows three little girls, Molly, 14, her sister, 8-year-old Daisy, and their 10-year-old cousin, Gracie, as they are taken from their family to a camp. Upset at being so far from their mothers and their home, the young girls escape and set off on an arduous journey to find their way home, pursued by the authorities. Molly remembered her father once telling her about the rabbit-proof fence which crosses Western Australia from north to south. Her goal was simple – to find the fence and follow it home. After nine weeks of walking and hiding, they finally arrive home and are reunited with their family. B. Into the Wild The lonely death of Chris McCandless inspired a book, Into the Wild, and a film by the same name. Chris McCandless was a young American graduate who grew up in an affluent family in Washington, D.C. When he found out about his father's secret second family, he was so upset that he distanced himself from his family. He abandoned his real name and never contacted his parents or his sister again. 
After two years of hitchhiking around the Northwest, he decided to push himself to the extreme and hiked alone into the desolate wilderness of Alaska. He took pride in living simply and surviving with few belongings. He spent the next 16 weeks completely alone, hunting, reading, and camping in a deserted bus. In late July, it is thought that he ate some poisonous seeds that made him extremely ill and too weak to hunt for food. Realizing that he was going to die, Chris wrote a goodbye message, and a few weeks later some hunters found his body in the bus. This was his message. I have had a happy life, and thank the Lord. Goodbye, and may God bless all. C. Tracks In early 1977, Robin Davidson set out with only four camels and her dog to walk 2,700 kilometres from the central Australian desert to the Indian Ocean off the western coast. Nine months later, ragged, blistered and burned black by the sun, she reached her destination. An Aboriginal man, Mr. Eddie, accompanied her for three weeks, while photographer Rich Smolan joined her three times during the journey. Davidson, now 65, is back in the limelight. The book of her journey, Tracks, has been reissued and a film adaptation came out in 2013. Her route to the sea took her through remote regions and some of Australia's most inhospitable places. During nine long, hard months, she battled scorching temperatures, rotten food, thirst, navigation errors, and injured camels. But far more challenging were the psychological aspects. At one point, Davidson found herself being swallowed by the vastness of the desert and losing all sense of self, space, and time. Despite that, she says, I love the desert and its incomparable sense of space. I enjoy being with Aborigines and learning from them. I like the freedom inherent in being on my own, and I like the growth and learning processes that develop from taking chances. D. Wild. Cheryl Strade's surname is not her original name. It's a name she invented for herself. After the death of her mother in 1991, Cheryl's grief caused her to lose her way in life. She felt she had strayed. Devastated by the loss of her mother to cancer, Cheryl turned to drugs. Then her husband divorced her, and finally she realized she had lost her own sense of identity. Cheryl decided to challenge herself by hiking along the Pacific Crest Trail in an attempt to find the person she used to be. This was not an easy task. The PCT runs for 1,100 miles through California from Mexico to Canada and is certainly not a journey for novices. But Cheryl filled a backpack to bursting and set off. Three months later, after struggling through wilderness and crossing nine mountain ranges, Cheryl made it to the end. The journey had been physically and mentally hard for the inexperienced hiker. She had endured 100-degree temperatures, record snowfalls, and encountered bears and rattlesnakes. The giant backpack was so heavy that she called it Monster. But the journey had done what she wanted. It had healed her. Cheryl wrote a book about her journey, and this in turn inspired an amazing film called Wild, starring Reese Witherspoon as Cheryl. It shows the healing power of her journey in the wild. CD 3 Track 28 1. Challenge Challenging 2. Growth Grown. Three. Injury. Injured. 
4. Poison. Poisonous. 5. Rag. Ragged. 6. Thirst. Thirsty. 7. Vastness. Vast. CD 3. Track 29. I've been watching a program about extreme weather events. Interesting, but very scary. What they did was show the effects of some recent floods where people had lost absolutely everything. Rarely have I seen such devastating scenes. What I find shocking is that some people still believe that humans have nothing to do with climate change. I don't think you can blame humans. What? It's those kind of comments that really annoy me. How can you say that? All I'm saying is that there's no link between carbon emissions and climate change. What's happened is that scientists have invented global warming so they can get more funding. Are you serious? Not only are you making ridiculous accusations, but you don't even know the basic facts. Of course, it's carbon emissions that are to blame for global warming. CD3, track 30. Have you ever wondered what mysteries lie directly beneath your feet? Of course, there are your socks and shoes, and the floor. Then possibly a cellar, then probably earth and rocks, and then perhaps an underground lake. Or perhaps something altogether more unexpected, something ancient and astonishingly beautiful. In 2000, mineral miners from the town of Naika in northern Mexico made an astounding discovery beneath the ground. What they found took the idea of buried treasure to a whole new level. During this presentation, I plan to tell you more about Cueva de los Cristales, a truly incredible natural wonder. We are all familiar with underground caves from films and documentaries, even if we have never actually been in one ourselves. You may be aware that caves can be very dangerous places, but also fascinating places. Most people don't realize, however, just how stunning they can actually be. When those Mexican miners drained the water from a system of underground caverns at the beginning of the new millennium, their discovery proved that caves can be among the most awe inspiring environments on the planet. Hiding and growing in the darkness for half a million years, the enormous crystals of Cueva de los Cristales, or Giant Crystal Cave, now on the screen, are some of the biggest ever discovered. The largest is 12 meters long, 4 meters in diameter, and weighs 55 tons. Unfortunately, you won't be able to visit them anytime soon as the caves are extremely hot. Temperatures of up to 58 degrees Celsius mean that without proper protection, it is impossible to remain underground there for more than 10 minutes at a time. As you can see in this picture, scientists exploring the caves in 2006 had to wear breathing equipment and specially designed suits to keep them cool. It is believed that there are more undiscovered caverns at Naika, but exploring them would mean demolishing many of the crystals already uncovered. Instead, the plan is to finish doing research, then re flood the caves with water and seal them up again. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you for listening. I hope you found the presentation interesting. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask now.